So welcome everybody. I have uh, two roles tonight. One is as panelist and the first is as, as host and I'll keep the latter brief, but I wanted to set the stage a little bit and to welcome you on behalf of the New America Foundation. My name is Steve Collin. I'm the president of New America. For those of you, of you who don't know who we are, we're a think tank with about 100 folks, 10 years old, headquartered in Washington. We work up here and in California as well. And one reason why we're uh, the, involved with this is from the very beginning, New America has been informed by journalists and journalism. <coughs> I'm one of the bits of evidence of that, having spent 20 years of my own uh, career at the Washington Post before going to New Yorker and then finding my way to New America. But the founding uh, chairman of New America was Jim Fallows, the terrific journalist based at The Atlantic, and Fareed Zakari and others uh, have been on the board from the beginning. And New America itself is eclectic. We have economists and lawyers and policy wonks and journalists all in the same fishbowl, and that produces interesting work and interesting discourse. But the journalists uh, in, that, uh, in that stew uh, do cling to their professional uh, vision and, and work habits and values and, and ethics, and many of us are people who have worked at other institutions that we care a great deal about, even as alumni, and, and think a lot about the future of journalism. And I think the only uh, sort of framing remarks that I wanted to make before turning it over to my colleague Andres is that at New America, broadly in all of our work, domestic policy, social policy, economic policy, foreign policy, we feel very conscious, as I'm sure many of you in your own lines of endeavor do, that this is a period of transformation in national life. Some of the transformation is being authored and some of it is uh, destructive or unexpected. But it, this is an inflection point in history that's obvious. And there's a sort of interaction between the transformation that is created and the transformation that is unbidden that comes out of the forces of economic crisis or, or rapid political change. And it's that interaction between shaping events and, and being controlled by events that is also present in the transformation of journalism and the transformation of media. And I think when we turn to the subject of the future of journalism, the future of newspapers, there are, there are sort of two ways you come at that subject, two forms of discourse that interact with each other. There is the search for new models, and some of the folks here are involved in that search, and some of the folks in the audience are involved in that search. New models, new models that will work economically, new models that will work as audience strategy. Uh, but there's, there's another angle of approach, which is from journalism, from journalists, from, from the need to adapt the distinctive accident of civil service modeled professional journalism that grew up in the post-war period in this country and in Europe. Perhaps Tim and I were joking, as accidental as the music that was patronized by the Habsburg court at the end of the 18th century, and that when it was threatened with disappearance, people decided they ought to conserve it. And in any event, whatever the model associated with that journalism and its future, there are some of us who are interested in that. They start with that. How do you preserve the journalism, the values, the professional practices, the constitutional role of that journalism that we have known as a country since you know the 1950s, 1960s? And if you take those two forms of conversation, models and journalism, and connect them together, then I think you're right at the heart of things, and that's our ambition tonight uh, with Andres in the lead. So let me just introduce uh, my colleague, Andres. One of the ways that we're involved in journalism in New America is that we have a fellows program, a couple of fellows programs that, that fills up some of the space that newspapers are leaving behind by creating foundations for journalistic careers along with other kinds of careers. And Andres is the director of our fellows program. He also is a refugee from the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times a lawyer and lots of other interesting things, but uh, Andres, thanks. Welcome. Thanks, Steve. Um, we have a, uh, an embarrassment of riches up here in that we have a great panel, and it's a large panel, and we also have a lot of, uh, you know, uh, great uh, knowledge in the audience, so we're going to 
you know, I apologize in advance for the fact that I'm not going to do justice to everybody on this panel, but we want to keep the conversation going. And, and also, I'm not going to do justice in the introductions in the interest of time. But let me just quickly uh, introduce you all to our panel, Steve Call, you know. Uh, Tim Wu is one of our fellows at New America. Um, his day job is uh, he teaches at Columbia Law School. Uh, Tim is one of the foremost tech gurus in the country, uh, often gets credited with coining the term net neutrality, uh, wrote a book called Who Owns the Internet, and is now writing a book on uh, media cycles, looking at sort of how mass media technologies that have been adopted in the past and the cycles that they go through. Um, he just did a presentation down in Washington yesterday on, on his book, which is a work in progress, and it was terrific, so we're lucky to have him. Edward Felsenthal um, <coughs> is uh, editor editor, managing editor, I don't even know your title, but <laughs> he makes sure that you all can read The Daily Beast. Edward is uh, working on The Daily Beast, and uh, I, I've known Edward since uh, his days at the Wall Street Journal. Before. Where he was assistant manager. Actually, I knew you when you were pretending to be a lawyer, too. But um, Edward has, done, has made the transition from old media to the, uh, the new, one of the new models. Um, John Thornton is also with us. He is a, a general partner at Austin Ventures. Is that the right? Uh, and is involved in, in as a venture capitalist trying to uh, you know figure out a lot of the, the challenges here and doing uh, new online media in Texas based out of Austin. Um, Richard Topol is the general manager of ProPublica uh, which many, as many of you know is one of the kind of leading edge uh, players in the field of trying to fill the void that's being uh, kind of created as big media retrenches. ProPublica uh, is a non, not-for-profit investigative um, journalism outfit that um, uh, Paul, Paul Steiger, the former editor of the Wall Street Journal, is, is heading up on the journalism side. So, and you also wrote a book on Dow Jones, right, the history. So, great panel. Um, let's get to it. I just, uh, as a matter of introduction, want to uh, confess to my own confusion. I, uh, um, you know, I joined the, I, I, bailed out of the law and went into journalism in 94 and uh, then to really sort of double down in a crazy way. I went to work for Tribune Company in 2004. Um, I was lured out there by uh, Michael Kinsey and I think uh, as we were getting started sort of the, the, a lot of the big layoffs uh, started. But one of the things that's, that strike, that strike me in thinking about the last few years um, and a lot of people have touched upon this. One of the, the things that's odd about the fate of the newspaper industry today is more people than ever are reading newspapers. Uh, if you add the uh, people reading the print editions and uh, online editions. So while it's instructive to think back at sort of other technologies that have become obsolete and how transitions occurred, this is one of the real head scratchers, I think, when it comes to newspapers that Steve has touched upon in his writings and Walter Isaacson in his recent timepiece and you know the, the business model is anachronistic but the demand for the actual journalistic product is not and another you know a kind of related point is um, this idea that why would you know people talk about why would I pay for something that's free online but it, it's even more backwards than that because you actually get more online you know when I think back at my three years at the LA Times we were, you know, we were spending very late nights trying to enrich the offerings of our opinion pages on, on the internet, on our website. You know, we're having to like let go staff and shrink uh, because too many of our readers weren't paying, but we were killing ourselves to service that <laughs> readership that wasn't paying online. So it's it's a very interesting transition time that, um, you know, I, nobody's obviously figured out. And we arranged to have the New York Times have a front page story today on <laughs> on. Uh, you know, because it is a big media conspiracy still, even though it's a shrinking thing. Um, uh, and and this, this goes to my confusion, too. On the train up from D.C., I was reading the story about uh, endangered species that are metropolitan newspapers. And then I picked up a latest copy of Fortune and read this article that was very exciting about all the, the latest uh, breakthroughs in the, you know, the e-reader technologies and these kind of futuristic-like devices that are apparently are just a couple years away that, uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of the Kindle, but these are, you know, flexible plastic like and 3d and and that's apparently what we're going to be reading whatever is going to replace the newspapers if not newspapers themselves but to get us started in thinking about the danger of uh, 
what this transition implies in terms of what might get lost as people try to figure out the next business model. I want to come back to Steve and have him just flesh out for a minute uh, just to be cognizant of what we are talking about in terms of uh, what the risks are to uh, you know our, our civil society and our democracy and, and kind of um, our constitutional framework if uh, newspapers as we know them today are not around to see the sort of the next big uh, innovations in terms of the business model. Thanks. I mean, I, I think since I accidentally got into this discourse about nonprofit newspapers and dowing newspapers and, and the future of newsrooms, I've been challenged to think through myself in a way that was very constructive what it is, because I, I don't want to make the case for journalism and the First Amendment. I think that that's, let's take that for granted and pocket it. And let's also assume that uh, self publishing and new media and the spread of a new kind of penny press uh, will produce quite a lot of the open participatory discourse that the First Amendment contemplated. In fact, structurally, that publishing probably looks a little closer to the 18th century than, than uh, the post-war period. But so you, I, I narrow the question down, what in these big legacy newsrooms is likely to be destroyed in this transition, notwithstanding audience demand for it, that it's difficult to see how the new models will replace. Uh, and I think that that's a, that's a narrower question. I mean, I had a very interesting appearance with Matt Iglesias, who was arguing, he said, you know, there's nothing sacred about a newsroom that does crossword puzzles and foreign correspondence at the same time. I agree with that. Uh, but on the other hand, that formula is what attracted the audience uh, to some extent. So you, you, you have both the potential destruction of the journalism that can't be replaced, and you have the potential destruction of these big audiences, influential audiences that may be replaced, but it's not clear yet. So I do, in, in specifically then, foreign correspondence is extremely expensive and essential to the successful conduct of foreign policy in a democracy. And there is no evidence that the syndicated research model that is emerging in the aftermath of newspaper-based foreign correspondence is going to produce the same quality of reliable information independently gathered and independent from the government's, from the, from the government's agenda, inconvenient information in the system, creatively and independently gathered in the field. Every bureau that the New York Times operates today in a peaceful environment costs, you know, at least, I would guess, 150, 200,000 a year, never mind operating in Iraq or in Bosnia and elsewhere. I mean, you're talking uh, just to move your people around safely about enormous investments. So that's one obvious thing. I, I do think that there is, there are, even in domestic models, advantages to the size and confidence and interaction and the career paths that are available in the big newsrooms and I worry about their destruction. Um, there, there was a, a way in which the accident of the civil service model of journalism created a certain kind of independence of mind, independence of inquiry, that I fear is that issue. But I don't want to take too much time, so I'll stop there, and, and I'm sure other people can fill in the gap. But that, to me, is the question. What disappears from those newsrooms that will not be replaced? Right. I actually, the, uh, the, your estimates for the cost of the Foreign Bureau sound pretty... Uh, Pretty extravagant. Pretty modest. Uh, Pretty modest. But the Post was always famous for having their foreign. We were only. I, I, we were a hundred thousand a year, and so I just doubled it, guessing at the New York Times. So. Well, the foreign correspondents <laughs> at the Post were were famous for they, they worked out of their homes, so you kept yes. the bureau costs. Uh, um, yeah, all in, probably lower. more. Or less. But when you think about something like the New York Times and Baghdad having sixty-five security guards, um, can the Daily Beast pull that off? <laughs> <laughs> you may need it. Tina Brown does the work of ten security guards. <laughs> <laughs> no, but seriously, I, you know, I think part of the the debate, um, you know, a lot of us who came out of the you know newspaper world have this, you know, it's easy for us to sort of presuppose that the future of news, you know, is inherently tied to the future of newspapers, and there might be some, as Mandy Glasses and others, who point out that, well, geez, maybe that's not necessarily true. You've done this transition of having gone from. The Wall Street Journal to the Daily Beast. How do you, where do you come out on that question? Well, I mean, in one big respect, we're very dependent on the future of newspapers. You know, about 60% of what's on our website is aggregated. And, um, uh, you know, today, as it happens, um, 
by complete coincidence, uh, we were approached earlier in the week by an extremely talented Bloomberg reporter who had been laid off at a mass wave earlier in the week and, and is obsessed with Madoff and wanted to be in the courtroom today. And so we had an on-the-ground uh, presence uh, there and, and a couple of terrific pieces out of it. But um, that may be the only time in the five months that we've launched, not that we don't do our own reporting and our own original work, that we have covered a, a major uh, event like that you know, on the ground. And we don't have to because um, we can link to a terrific piece in the Times or, or the Journal. or. Uh, so you're, are you saying you're a free writer? Is that... We're, we like to call it p pilfering, not theft. Um, uh, no, you know, we, we, we send traffic back, and, and you know, there is this, this whole, uh, um, uh, you can, uh, mutually supportive or shell game, depending on how you define it, where we send people to other websites and other websites send people back to us. Um, but but we're, we're certainly, um, you know, we're very proud of, of the 40% the of our website that is self-generated. Right. Um, and included Let a terrific scoop, by the way, an investigative scoop uh, this week by Lucinda Franks about um, Madoff itself. So it's not that we we completely depend on this network, but we, we you know, it's it's part of who we are, and its survival is as important to us as it is to everybody else, or, or the survival of the mechanisms that Steve talked about. Right. Uh, let me draw in Richard, because I think, you know, one of the things that is, I mean, I think everybody can understand that when you're talking about opinion journalism, uh, the LA Times and New York Times, you know, they don't have that much up on, you know, the, the Mickey Kaus and his, and his bathrobe in LA, you know. Uh, but when you're talking about the foreign coverage and the investigative reporting, you know, clearly that's, that's where the kind of economies of scale and the civil service model of the journalistic career that Steve was talking to comes into play. Now, if we're breaking up the kind of the big newsroom, the network, you know, the question is, can niche players fill those those gaps and fulfill that service. ProPublic is trying to do that on the investigative front. If you could talk a little bit about how it's going, can you guys pull it off? Um, I think you can, but I think it, it's, um, well, there, there are two, two things you need to do. One, you need to generate great content, and two, you need to come up with some way to pay for it. I mean, Steve's two eras. One is the journalism, and the other is the business model. Um, they are to some extent, separate problems, and they obviously meet in the middle. But um, with respect to investigative journalism, I think you're right. You do not, you're not going to produce world-class investigative journalism if you hire um, all amateurs. And so we haven't. One of the things that we thought was important um, in embarking on this was to have enough money to be able to hire world-class people, and to hire world-class people means you need to pay them market salaries. And so that's what we've done. So we've hired some people like Jeff Gerth, who uh, won a couple of Pulitzers for the New York Times, and uh, Charlie Ornstein and Tracy Weber uh, from the Los Angeles Times, and, and on and on. Um, now, that's not the only folks we've hired, because we are concerned about career paths, and if these other places from which you can take these people today, and Lord knows there's, there's more... Uh, supply than there is demand for them, but we also want at some point to grow our own, and so we hired a certain number of very promising young people, and we would we'd hope that we can turn those people into the Jeff Girths and the Charlie Ornstein and Tracy Webers of tomorrow. Um, and I think we can. And, and you, just to be, just so, so people who might not know this, and I, I barely understand this, you partner up with local mid-sized papers across right. the country on, well, we on do. individual series? Is that how we do two or three things in investigative reporting. We uh, publish, um, we aggregate essentially all of the investigative reporting being done in the country every day on our website um, and lay it out for people in what we call breaking on the web. We also do short form investigative reporting, some of which is looking at other people's work, a good bit of it which is original but is <coughs> relatively uh, narrow, sort of bite size, in internet length. Uh, what you would be used to. And then we do uh, rather traditional long-form journalism, although we augment it for the web in all the exciting ways that you can. And with that third category of story, we our model is that we give these stories exclusively to a partner or partners in traditional platforms. So ranging from 
60 Minutes to the New York Times to CNN to the Los Angeles Times to the Chicago Tribune and on and on. And we've worked with all those people on uh, and, and done long form stories with all of them since we started to publish last June. And that works. Um, we, we think we've proven that that model works. We've found receptivity for it in newsrooms all around the country. Um, the best test is whether you get invited back to do it again. We have in all of those places, literally. Um, and the number of partners is growing. CNN and the Chicago Tribune are, are new uh, to this in the last month or so. And we've got a major newspaper with whom I think we're going to do a first piece in the next week or two. Mm -hmm. So, um, the uh, so that part of it I think is working, and I think that can be done. I think we've demonstrated that fairly quickly. The business model part is harder. We've been very fortunate. We um, got a major long-term grant from the Sandler Foundation in San Francisco that helped conceive ProPublica, and we've gotten other philanthropic support. Um, so we have a number of years to prove out both that we can produce the content and then to develop uh, a long-run or permanent model. And I think that'll involve some element of philanthropy, but it's clearly going to have to involve other revenue right. sources as well. So I guess the question is, uh, you know, is this part of, uh, you know, one of several avenues that uh, might get us to the brave new world, or is this going to be something that will become the kind of the mainstay of how traditional journal journalism gets done? Let, let me just turn quickly to John um, to tackle that and, and also just take us forward, you know, 10, 15 years, and what do you expect? Uh, where will the New York Times and the Washington Post be then? Will they be on paper? Will they exist? Will they still be owned by the... Uh, the, the, the sort of founding families, or what? What does the future hold? How, how, long, I saved, how long do you have? I saved the easy question for you. Right. Um, well, I mean, take the easy one. Uh, and and again, my my presence here is uh, schizophrenic in the sense that I'm a um, card carrying, greedy venture capitalist, but my interest in journalism is as much as a citizen uh, as anything else. And and we. In 2005, um, we uh, set a bunch of bright young people uh, to work on the notion that there's this $45 billion industry called newspaper industry in, uh, in the United States that is essentially going away. And it's, it's just a debate of at what speed. And so greedy guys like us get paid for making money in other people's distress. And so let's figure out a way to make money in, in, in that wake. And, after about a year and a half, we gave up. Uh, we we just said, for the most part, there will be, and you know, uh, Yokai Benkler has this, I think, really short and really good response to Paul Starr's cover article in New Republic that I guess was a couple weeks ago on this topic, and he just says, look, there are four or five models that are that will constitute the future of journalism, and it's not all one, it's not not all the other. But for our money, for our capitalist pretense, we just said none of these are really going to be terrific businesses. And you know, Barry, Barry Diller um, has forgotten more than I'll ever know about building terrific businesses. But we just said, um, nah, n not so much with our money, uh, and and so. Uh, the, the the one answer that I'll give to your direct question is um, the Washington Post, New York Times, they won't be on paper. Um, the, and and how long that takes is anybody's guess. But what whatever you think about Sam Zell, he said one of the most intelligent things about the newspaper business from a capitalistic perspective that you could say. And, and I teach business school classes occasionally. And I, I think about standing in front of a business school class and saying, you are the CEO of a large new enterprise. You are uh, 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 publicly, you're, you're respected in, in your community, but your problem is as follows. You, 80% of your cost structure, between 65 and 80% of your cost structure is fixed, and it, it is dedicated to a product for which there is no audience in anyone born before or after 1980. What do you do? Well, you leave. I mean, you go get another job. But that's that is what is facing print newspapers, and so um, that that's just the absolute tippy tippy tip of the iceberg of of the problem this industry is facing. 
That was true. I'm gonna turn over here. I'm gonna turn over here. Tim, I didn't forget about you. That's alright. Um, answer that question, Wes. Oh, are you okay? I mean, there, there have been a lot of great, I mean, there, one of the upsides to this uh, depressing period in journalism is that there is a lot of experimentation. Um, there's a lot being lost, but there, there's a lot of experimentation. And as people kind of debate the future and come up with ideas, there seem to be kind of different camps evolving. One camp holds that, you know, this the idea of the original sin, that newspapers, you know, gave uh, the beginning the, the, the beginning of the end was the day that newspapers stopped charging for their content by putting it free online. Uh, then you have the sort of Steve Call camp uh, about, you know, let's let's create a sort of a down model and, and have foundations underwrite this, and, and that's gaining a, a lot of traction, as, as we see in ProPublica and other uh, things that are being proposed. Um, and then there's sort of, I think, the, the folks who still hold out hope that... <coughs> you know, as this migration unfolds, the advertising market online will, will eventually catch up and that you will be able to replicate what you had done earlier on print. Um, yeah. But a lot of this feels like we're just, uh, we're, we're, we're perhaps overlooking the possibility of some dramatic, dramatically different business model that might actually work. Um, what it, right. You've studied, you know, the sort of the rise of new technologies right. throughout yes. the 20th century. Where, where do you come down on, on all of this? Uh, yeah, well, I think if we were having this, this conversation on the, the West Coast, um, people would be saying very different things. First of all, they would start by saying that that journalists overrate themselves, I guess, and, and you know they, they probably have to do a couple things, but it's things that people could learn in, in six months or something like that, or a year, and, and become just as good. And, and I, I'm not sure if I agree with that, but I want to sort of say that maybe it is a, I realize it's almost a heresy in this room to say this, or in New York, but to say that you know, we did have this 20th century model of, of journalism uh, premised on having giant sort of centralized structures, uh, and it had its merits, but it, it isn't clear that, that, that it, there's a lot of advantages of decentralized structures as well, uh, that, you know, maybe you won't have as good uh, 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 foreign coverage and so forth, be a lot, have a lot more diversity, a lot more outlets, and I think you referred to this already. Um, I just want to get back to this question of what the future is, if there's a great new business model. I, I'm often drawn to the answer that there is isn't really no business that model answer, and that there's really no hope for a commercial model for newspapers. I, I, I'm not sure. There's a lot of things that do not work commercially. They're just, I mean, when situations change. We happen to have an unusual environment in the 20th century, we had enormous barriers to entry for information for a lot of different reasons because of technological. It could be that in open market, things like invest, uh, investigative journalism, more particularly foreign bureaus, that they really don't make any sense at all. And in that situation, being in academia or other areas, you ask, well, where, where does your... And when I look at the New York Times and Columbia University and the Metropolitan Museum of Art, I say, well, these institutions aren't that different. Mm -hmm. The only difference is one, two of them have giant endowments. They're all doing stuff that doesn't any, make any commercial sense. <laughs> None of them know how to really run a business. None of them are really in it for profit. Uh, just two of these organizations have gigantic endowments, and one of them has never learned how to raise money because they think they're a business. But they don't run it like a business. No one would run, I mean, no one would send someone to Beijing with a great house and hang out with Chinese leaders and call that a job, right? which is sort of what a foreign correspondent is. It's a great gig, but it's not a job that you think of being part of the capitalist system. Um, academics, we sit around, we teach stuff. I mean, it's a great gig, but it's not a job that you would imagine <laughs> capitalism would create. And so, I mean, you're trying to sound like my father. <laughs> when I told him I was... You know, capitalism <laughs> creates jobs like you know you're selling stuff in a factory somewhere. That's the jobs that are created by the commercial system. And so, if you want to have, I mean, that's a little exaggerated, but it, maybe it's just crazy to think at all that this is going to be commercial in the future. And and say if we really want the stuff, either it's government or it's or it's. Uh, Where's your endowment? Well, what is, how is that different from, I mean, CNN is also engaged in journalism, which is not a, you know, those people aren't doing, you know, real jobs by your definition. And yet, it seems like TV, there's sort of a model, I mean, right now it's depressed as well, but, mm -hmm. you know, the, the content providers are getting a regular stream of revenue from the, the cable, oh, right. the cable yeah, operators. Yeah, right. and, and one of the things that Walter Isaacson right. pointed out in his article, which I thought was actually probably more interesting than the big takeaway about charging for right. content was the idea that 
the IS, nobody, the, you know, the ISPs are getting a free ride. The, 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 you know, you, you pay a fee to your cable company to go online, but, but the, you know, they basically don't, you know, the New York right. Times doesn't get anything off of that or the other right. content right. providers. Right. So the other option is to dramatically change the internet. You'd have, I mean, you'd have to change the way. Well, that's what I was trying to get yeah, at. Is, right, is there like an right. inherent conflict here between yeah. the internet model and all the, yeah. the things that you, you know? Yeah, I mean, there's two very respectable principles at war here. One is that we like journalism, and we like what it does for democracy. And the other principle here is that we believe in open and free speech, which is what the internet does. And the internet allows you to reach an audience without paying to reach them. That's its definition. The cable system is a system where you pay to play. Right. Nobody gets on except for public access channels. <laughs> Nobody gets and says, "I'm gonna, you know, yeah. I have no budget. I'm gonna get on Stern." It's a pay-to-play network. So, if you want to save the newspapers commercially, you have to transform the internet into a pay-to-play network, or at least parts of it. If you want to do that, I would say the most hopeful thing you were saying earlier is hardware. That is, you, you, you. Is there some killer app that one of these newfangled devices that could create the new right. business model by having a where you subscribe for the killer app? You either, I mean, I. I'm going to suggest, I'll tell you what you do, I don't like it. You do a deal with AT&T, Comcast, and you prioritize the New York Times and the Walls, uh, LA, LA Times over all the blogs. And Daily Beast. And Daily Beast. You kill the Daily Only Beast. Only <laughs> what, what you really do, if you really want to know how you save the newspapers, it's not a pretty story. Is you, you, AT&T and Comcast do a deal to destroy the Daily Beast slate, Huffington Post, those guys, gone. You prioritize the Wall Street Journal, the CNN, those sites, you save them, you charge a lot of, you know, you do a little deal, you increase the price, they do a deal between themselves and they're saved. But the cost is you lose the Daily Beast slate, all the bloggers, you, you find them some way to kill them or make their <laughs> make them comparatively, you know, kill them. You make their site load in five seconds while the New York Times loads like that. That's how you save the newspaper, but the question is do you want to do it? <laughs> why, don't you, why don't we get Steve back in here? And Steve, if, if well, you could... All right, so I, I want to go back to this kind of analogy of, of conserving um, culture, value, letters that are destroyed by changes in the business model. Because I do think that it's a valid analogy. We have opera because we choose to conserve it. Think of all the things that we conserve. There's no natural law about what any society should choose to conserve, never mind an open democracy. We can choose to conserve that which we think is valuable, and we should be reevaluating that all the time, as we do. Mm -hmm. So we choose to conserve opera, and we con we conserve art in certain forms, and 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 that's not the only opera and the only art that's created, but it's important. We conserve public spaces, we conserve um, other things that we think is important to our society and our democracy. So I think part of the the case for conserving journalism does rely on some view that there is a version of journalism that will disappear that's valuable and that ought to compete with other things to be conserved. And I'm not, I don't take for granted that that argument wins because there certainly are lots of reasons to be skeptical about the civil service culture of journalism and the people that ran it and their presumptions and their arrogance and their, their distance from their audiences and so forth. But I'm prepared to compete. I, I, you know, we, let's get started would be the kind of uh, the proposition. But there's another thing which as a sort of think tank person I feel compelled to throw in, even though it's a little bit radical in this country, which is, is there a public policy interest in the preservation of any of these things? I mean, of course, in Europe, they, they really haven't hesitated to have this conversation. We're the exception. We're the only, I think we're probably the only industrialized democracy. Maybe Japan is another case where there is no public policy incentive for the creation and preservation of of civil service style journalism as an element of national interest, particularly in relation to global affairs. So, you know, the, the BBC will, will go when the Queen goes. I mean, it is so integral to the sense of Britain's place in the world. And even though you could walk through the rest of Europe and come up with different examples in tax policy, licensing policy, you know, if you, if you suggest in the United States that, there, that there's a public policy role, it takes you to philanthropy, but there, there's a state interaction with philanthropy that, that still might be politically plausible, at least are you in this moment. <laughs> no, are, you for, are you trying to get part of the stimulus plan? <laughs> so, so, exactly. I, I mean, it's, it's, well, yeah, I mean, as, um, <laughs> the, the, I, I just thought of the, the Woody Allen line that, um, 
when I think about the problems with newspapers, and it was whatever movie it was, that it's uh, it's not that your problems aren't serious; it's just not that they're very interesting. Right? <laughs> and that's that that that's <laughs> there is a there is an answer to a piece of the question Steve raises that comes up in the in the second month of your first microeconomics class in college, which is. There's this. There are these things called public goods, and once society agrees on what a public good is, and the classic examples are public defense, civil defense, clean water, clean air. By definition, markets fail at providing public goods. That's that's just that's the the, the graph gets drawn and it's you know demonstrated. There is. I think at least an argument that, and, and what's critically important, I think, is this definition of what is it that's going to go missing, because you have to define that before you can say, is that a public good or not? And so what we've been batting around, there's this guy, um, Tom Peters, who is um, from my old firm, McKinsey, he wrote this book called In Search of Excellence in the, in the 80s, and Peters had this framework for great organizations, and he called it the 7S framework. Well, it was just basic business school, I mean, kind of business school 101 stuff, but he realized that you had to have everything had to start with an S for people to remake. Because he, he, I saw this interview, he had like five S's and two C's. And somebody said, no, you got to get that seven S's if, if this is going to work. And if you think about uh, the four C's of what I call capital J journalism, curatorial, it's, it requires courage. And so it requires an institutional structure uh, um, around it. It is it addresses complexity in the right way. It doesn't oversimplify, nor does it uh, overcomplicate. And it's civic. It connects back to kind of the reader's political reality and, and how they make a decision in a in a voting booth. That's just an idea. But once you can define the public good in that way, then you can say, look. This is, it's, you don't have to apologize for the market failing because you expect market failure around public goods. And, and so, I mean, in the same, so in the same um, front page of the New York Times today, the, the Philadelphia Sym Symphony Orchestra, one of the big five orchestras in the country, is uh, challenged. That's a $47 million, a year, I mean, forget endowments. That's a forty-seven million dollar a year organization, right? In the in a in a and it's it's a uh, a venerable symphony, and that and that's great. And they pay the the cellist on average makes one hundred twenty-six thousand eight hundred fifty dollars a year. And 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 we've Julie and I, my wife and I, have done far more arts philanthropy than we have anything else. But you start thinking about okay, if it is a public good, and if if unlike other public goods, government kind of can't provide it. I mean, your BBC uh, example notwithstanding, that's kind of the point, right, is, is this is supposed to be a watchdog on government. Where else do you go but philanthropy? And if Philadelphia can come up with 47 million bucks a year for their symphony, I, I, I just think what, so my sort of uh, outside my day job, my, my interest is in beginning to talk to people about just shifting civic and philanthropic priorities, just to think about it. Yeah. Do, do, does anybody on the panel think that universities might be part of the answer? I mean, if if part of the the courage and the scale that you need uh, requires a, a larger institutional heft behind the journalists, the news gathering operation, and and if we're going to have a, you know, to the extent that we're thinking about a philanthropic model. Um, I mean, in an ideal world, we'd have large independent foundations, but is is part of the great leap here that for some university to kind of uh, broaden its, its, its kind of mission statement, you know, we're in the, to say we're in the business of disseminating knowledge and information, and so we're going to take on the local newspaper? I, I would say not, and and I mean, I'm, luckily I think I have. I, all I, the, I have all the degrees that I <laughs> am going to get, so I, I feel <laughs> can wade into this uh, for a couple of reasons. One, honestly, I think our universities, um, as institutions, are enormously conservative um, institutionally, 
uh, at a time when the evolution of the media is such that the people who are going to need to guide the more successful journalistic organizations, at least until we have gotten through this transition, and I'm not sure we'll ever get through it, but at least until you get to some clear water uh, of the sort that we had for 20 or 30 years, 30 or 40 years ago, um, I, I can't imagine universities having the, the appetite for risk um, and for controversy that would be required to steer a really robust journalism organization. Um, but to go back to Steve's point, I mean, I, I and picking up on John's, I, I think we can start to define what the public goods are, and I don't think we need to actually get all that abstract about it. I think Steve's right that international reporting is one. I think investigative reporting is another. And I think it may unfortunately be becoming, beginning to become clear that um, serious analytic reporting of a sort at mm -hmm. the local level in every community in America is yet another. Mm -hmm. um, commodity news, on the other hand, is not. I don't think commodity news is endangered, in fact, and I don't think opinion is endangered. I, um, I think there are but lots we, we of ways to get that, those supported. We can all agree that there's a public good, but is that, are you suggesting that there's, would there's some kind of, is that, are you suggesting that there's, would there's some kind of opening for a public, there's a need for some kind of public policy to encourage this, or is it just, once again, we're talking about the not-for-profit model? Well, no, if we're talking about public policy, I don't have a problem with that. If we're talking about public financing, I do. I mean, first of all, I don't think we ought to kid ourselves, right? There's been public policy all along. Public policy undergirds philanthropy in this country. You saw this enormous wail from elements of, frankly, the left when it was suggested right. two weeks yeah. ago for a minute that um, rich people uh, shouldn't be able to take more off their taxes for charitable deductions than poor people, and people, people who otherwise spend half their lives campaigning for progressive income taxes went crazy. Right. Um, that's a public policy. Uh, the postal regulations are a public policy, and mm -hmm. without the subsidy in the postal regulations, the magazine business would have been out of business a very long time ago. So I don't have any problem with public policies, and I'm open to, to thinking of new ones. Um, I do have a very serious problem with public financing because I share John's instinct about that. And just one more thing before I put this down, which is I, I also think that while that we should not lose sight of the fact that there are revenue streams beyond philanthropy that I think journalism is going to be able to continue to attract. I don't think they are sufficient, mm -hmm. but I think they are not negligible. Mm -hmm. Advertising is way down, but it's not gone. Mm -hmm. um, user fees are probably not enough, but they can be very significant. Uh, and there's some other examples. Well, on that point, um, I, I, Edward, I wanted to ask you before we, you know, let us not, let us not be too quick to bury uh, all of journalism as a commercial endeavor. I mean, you, both you and, and Richard, were at the Wall Street Journal, which you know is charging real money from a lot, awful lot of people um, to read their content. I mean, do you think do you see some kind of differentiation here going forward in terms of? Uh, some newspapers being able to make a go of it commercially and then a lot that won't, the, where we'll need this new model? Or? Well, um, as I uh, said to Andres when we were talking about this panel early in the week, I'm, I'm an expert in spending and not in monetization. <laughs> but um, um, on my side of the business. But, um, but I, I, um, I am not in despair overall. I mean, my, um, you know, this is... This is an opinion based on, I think, uh, it's, it's an instinct, really, frankly, um, based on, on 15, now I guess 17 years in the business, um, and seeing a lot of success and a lot of failure both. But, you know, my, my instinct is that um, there will be tremendous consolidation um, and tremendous loss, but also tremendous innovation, and that the answer will not be nearly as stark as the extremes being proposed here. In fact, I think. Dick um, essentially uh, gave what I think is 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 the is the answer um, when he said that he even even the all the Sandler's money cannot cannot permanently sustain right. ProPublica. Um, well, it could. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> 
it could, all all the Sandler's money. We actually wouldn't even need all of it, right. but not all. Of more, it. more of it, maybe. But but um, but that there are going to be multiple rev- revenue streams, and we, you know, uh, certainly you look at the Wall Street Journal where Dick and I both came from, and and um, which is having its tremendous troubles like everybody else is, but. The revenue streams are multiple. It's it's advertising, it's subscription. It's you look at the D conference, um, which Dick ran for for some years while he was there, and it's it's become a huge, a yeah. huge money maker. And um, and you know there are uh, potential you know premium platforms. You look at what uh, David Bradley's been able to do um, with National Journal. I, I mean, to me, the the um, the most inspiring example in the field um, today is Politico, which um, if you believe the press. Uh, that that they get, um, you know, have, have a have a have a growing, sustainable, apparent seems to be sustainable business model that's based on a combination of advertising supported free online and and subscription uh, subscription print. Um, not so sure. Not so sure. Well, anyway, I, <laughs> I, you know, we can all sit around here and 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 despair and assume that we're all going to have to be publicly funded to survive. But I just, you know, I guess I place myself. Um, uh, and I've forgotten everything I learned in microeconomics, so take it with a huge grain. Um, uh, but I, I just believe that um, we're going to go through a period of extreme, a long period of extreme pain, and we'll end up. Um, uh, you know, it, all the doom in the media world right now, and and if you and and you have to take um, uh, Prozac Plus to, to for to spend a, a, a half an hour on Romanesco, um, you know, just. It's just I'm making a Jim Cramer comment here. Um, I think I think we're nearing the market bottom. You know. Um, uh, you heard it here. No, I just. In I, what? It, I, I I just it may take it may take five years. It may take ten years, but um, I think we're in a period of creative uh, uh, d- destruction, and 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 a model will, will come out of it. People do. One last thought. Um, you know, I, I don't think the the art model um, is quite right. When you look at, and Andres made the point in the introduction, there's a higher demand for our product uh, today than there ever has been. Uh, people, uh, you look at the election cycle we just went through, with the enormous. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't, you you you, you had to you had to pay. You know, we almost had to pay people not to read Christopher Buckley's piece about why he was voting yeah. for Obama. It was a phenomenon, um, and. Um, and, and a form of entertainment, and um, t- to be honest, you know that, that 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 we're part of, and I just think there is commercial value there, and I do not have the answer, but I'm I'm proud uh, and excited to be part of of a venture that's trying to see if if, you know, if we can find it. You don't wish you were still a baker and boss. One quick, me, here, one quick empirical I, point, because I think we get lost on this. Um, the idea that vast numbers more of more people are reading our stuff is true that they are reading some of our stuff. Right. But if you actually take a sharp pencil and look at minutes spent on a site, you will quickly conclude that, and look at the and look at the subscriber study, you will quickly conclude that of the 50, that the 50 million people, literally 50 million people, looking at the New York Times online, devote far less time to the New York Times in the aggregate during a day, a week, or a month than do the one million people who take it in print. That's a fair point. Um, let me, I want to get get to the audience, because uh, we're kind of long delayed, but um, do you have anything quick to add, Tim, since yeah, you were not doing during the university talk, and then we'll No, I, I wanted to, well, I, I, working for a university, I think we fund to take over a newspaper, right? <laughs> <laughs> to write whatever we want. you. Yeah, <laughs> but um, <laughs> that was, no, I'll, I'll just say there's some, that's not just, do you, you know Kim's video in, in New York, this famous video store? Well, it failed recently because of uh, Netflix destroyed by the internet. And um, Columbia is going to take over the Northern Collection. <laughs> so I, I was, it's kind of a model. You know, when media <laughs> companies start to fail, Columbia has already taken over video stores. Uh, there you go. I'll also notice that <laughs> University of Cal- video tomorrow, the New York yeah. Times. <laughs> and, and, or, or the matters. And, and it is also true that uh, newspapers, I'm uh, sorry, uh, universities have run radio stations for a long time, and, and respect and, and uh, publishing, yeah, and publishing, and, and university presses, and so there, there is a tradition. You're not just this yeah. is a, a long tradition, right. um, and it would be fun. But the point I wanted to say about revenue models and this debate, there, there definitely are new revenue models. I, I completely agree with that. The problem is, or the question is, 
whether those revenue models, I want to remind you, take you where you want to go. A lot of them take you in directions that are would save the media, but the question is at what cost? What media would it save? And what media would it save? Yes, it would preserve certain dominant or existing players at the cost of, of, of others, or, or maybe at the cost of an open speech environment. And um, there are yeah, there are plenty of models, but they're, 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 they mostly involve some form of integration, monopolization, discrimination, or you know some kind of fairly coercive practice that would usually see something like the Daily Beast crushed. And so, All those nasty words. I'm just saying, like, this is this is this is the this is the history of the right. media industry. So okay. they do save themselves. But I'm going to interrupt you and, and cut to the audience for questions, comments, something else.